here. Um, there will be one or two other packets we'll bring this evening. I have needed to talk to three people who are doing e productive class, and I'll announce it no later than the beginning of dinner. Hopefully, maybe by the end of the session, that I can get it out to everybody. Um, I'll let you know what it is we need to bring tonight, in addition to the thing that says conducting class and investors. Um, in your program for ECHO, and I realize that we have so many people that registered last minute. Lou, you have such excellent timing from right now. Here. You will notice that um, in the back of the program there is an advertisement for our fabulous fall conferences. Um, that Lou De La Rosa would like to talk to you about right here. Jeffrey and John Eager. Spectacular. Fall conferences are offered September 12th. I looked up and I go, I'm supposed to talk about it. September 12th, I am in the north in September 19th in the south. And we uh, have a wonderful lineup. John's going to tell us about some. Hi. Uh, this, this year, the Southern Conference is at CSU Fullerton, and our headliner is Andre Thomas uh, from Florida State. Um, so he will be there. And then uh, uh, reading sessions are broken down this year into advanced. So the advanced session, I think, he has had uh, lots of mixed, mixed repertoire, women's repertoire, men's repertoire. That will be led by Ryan Ward from Pepperdine, uh, a women's, women's chorus or women's voice. Uh, reading session will be by Desiree Lever too. Um, we have a, a, a unique uh, reading session this year called, I think it's titled California Composers for Every Ability Level, which will be led by Leslie Layton, who's the associate conductor of the Los Angeles Master Chorale, is also conducting the choruses at UCLA. Uh, so Leslie will be leading that session. And finally, Michael Bush will be leading a reading session in Music Full of Worship. So those are our four. Uh, reading session leaders and our headliners are Andre Thomas, September 19, CSU Fullerton. People in the South, see you, see you there. <laughs> Jeffrey Benson, in the north. Hi, our Northern Conference session the weekend before Southern on the 12th of September. He has in the back Dr. Sharon Paul, who's our headliner, and uh, she's fabulous. She's got three great sessions prepared for us, plus four other um, reading session leaders Gail Bowers from the North Bay. And uh, she'll be leading a session on high school literature and some vocal jazz, because she has a program that is <coughs> fabulous in both um, classical and the jazz realm. Um, who else? Uh, John Jacobson will be joining us. He's going to do two sessions, some choreography stuff that he does, as well as a reading session for children's choirs and junior high choirs. Um, we've got a uh, multicultural reading session by our very own Daniel Alonso from Cal State Stanislaus. And I'm totally blanking on Julie Ford doing sacred music and um, music for worship. Um, and so we would love to see you out. The big thing that the board is talking about, we would love for both the South and the North. Um, a lot of you um, maybe have just been at Echo, and so you think, I'm not going to come to a, another session right away in September, or life gets busy. We would love for you to be ambassadors to the people in your area. It's wonderful for you all to come and attend, but we would love to have our numbers grow a little bit at these fall region conferences. So if you know some people in your area, whether or not you can attend or not, if you would help us get the word out, we really would like to increase the numbers of these sessions. Dr. Sharon Paul and Dr. Andre Thomas are both wonderful headliners for these um, uh, one-day workshops. So we're hoping that you'll, you'll come. This year in the north, we're moving the site from Carlmont, where Genevieve has hosted the last few years, uh, to San Jose State University um, in, the, in the South Bay. So we hope you'll join us at one or both of those conferences. Thank you. And those of you who are uh, college and university uh, teachers. <coughs> this is where your students should be coming. This is the con these are the conferences that your students should be coming to and learning from. You know, we have wonderful headliners. We've got great uh, local resources. So there are faces that they will see in the future. These are the places where our students can begin to find out that being a part of a professional organization is what we do. And so please, those of you who teach, high school too, send your students to these regional conferences. They're going to be fantastic. Finally, there, were, there was mention of CASMAC, and it occurred to me that who the heck knows what CASMAC is? It stands for California All-State Music Education Conference. All together now. California All-State Music Education Conference. Very good. And it's going to be in San Jose and ACDA is going to have a significantly larger
larger footprint at that. In fact, it's going to be our first state conference. I'll tell you all about that at another time. <laughs>
about last year. So, okay, has anyone done this piece? Oh, yes. Well, they, the, the eldest one loved the tender with me. That's right. Now, okay, Anti Crisis, another accessible piece for high school, junior high. Um, and, um, and yeah, it uses some uh, dialect in this, original dialect in it. The only problem I see is it's not consistent. Do da, do da. And this is the fly the track. And I would do fly the track, you know. So you just need, you need to go through and kind of clean up some of the inconsistencies of it. All right, so here we go. Um, sit tall in your chair and bounce if you can. Here we go. One, two, three.
go. And so if you're doing some kind of Americana, here's another great verse. Next, uh, hard times come again no more. Are you pardon? <laughs> um, hard times come again no more. This is by Alice Parker. And it just came out this summer. And we, most of us are aware of um, Craig Pella Johnson's Hard Times. I think when I did the Allstate Choir here in California, I did his arrangement of that. It's beautiful. But this is a really wonderful setting for men. And notice it's for, uh, you can do it with guitar. And so I thought that that uh, might be really nice. It says down at the bottom, and the first page, that if you're going to do it with, with guitar, you should do it in E rather than E flat. <laughs>
Then a new piece called All the Diamonds. This is by uh, Bruce uh, uh, Cockburn. Is, am I in the right place? I think it is. Yeah, yes. And um, he's a, a Canadian composer. He's, he's the one that owns Cypress Music. He owns Cypress Music. And the arrangement is by, uh, I'm sorry, Larry Nickel owns Cypress Music. And it's Bruce Cochran, who's a guitar and songwriter. So Larry has made it a point with Cypress Music to try to bring some of these old Canadian folk songs, also music by like Gordon Lightfoot and things like that, and have them published in choral, uh, choral form. And you know, this is a sea, a sea shop, a sea, a sea song for a guy's course. I know, it's really unusual. Shop. <laughs> <laughs>
SSAA version of this. This, I think, is a great piece. I don't know, uh, Genevieve, did, they, yeah, did you give them the handout? Did you get this handout? Yeah. Did you get the rehearsal approaches? So just like this first session last night, I gave you some ways to approach to a Pani Sargelicus and the Bound for Jubilee. Same thing with this. And you could just substitute a couple things if you did the SSA version of this instead of the TTV. And this came out just, I think, last year, the TTV one. But just things like prior to the music, what you could do to teach the piece, things within, you know, once they actually see the music, and uh, just some things. So here's some teaching uh, effects. Ken, let's do it on solfege. Ready? Here we go. <laughs>
uh, on a choir. Uh, it comes together very quickly. As you can see how it's put together. There's one, there's two, there's three, with a refrain in between. And it comes together very quickly. And this is a great piece. I think you can do this in the fall if you have a men's group. Or you know what? You have a concert choir. Feature your man. Feature your man. I have a concert choir in high school. I don't have a men's course. Feature the man. You know, freshman, sophomore choir, junior, senior choir. Take the men from this one, take the men from that one, put them together. Have a 45, 50 voice men's chorus. Sing this at a concert. Guys will come up and go, I think I want to sing it. Because we, you know, we do that. Okay, cool. All right, now let's talk. Oh, by the way, I have two other pieces. Uh, Laura uh, uh, Farnell from uh, uh, Texas. It's not in your packet, but she's from Arlington, Texas, and she's a fabulous middle school uh, tech, uh, clinician. Have you ever had Laura Farnell do stuff? She's a composer, and uh, this is the We Shall Not Sleep, and it's a TTV piece, three part, and it's really cool because it's with optional oboe or flute, or you can just use a C instrument, maybe a recorder even, and it is the uh, yeah, Flanders Field. It's the Flanders Field uh, uh, text. So it'd be great for remembrance and renewal. So it's called We Shall Not Sleep. It's published by Alliance. I think that's a great piece. The other thing is, is that two or three years ago, I had a shrine saying, um, Entreat Me Not to Leave You by Dan Forrest. It was their favorite piece of singing all year. We toured with it in uh, Bulgaria, Istanbul. And um, now it's available in a men's version. The only thing is that I think this is a collegiate men's piece because it goes into like almost six part of the DC. It's pretty challenging. But it's a story of Ruth. And, and um, so it's just, it's really a beautiful piece. And it's published by Inshaw. And uh, in, entreat me not, don't say entreat. It's not entreat me not. It's entreat to entreat. And I've heard recordings of Fire singing, entreat me not to leave, and it's entreat. It's spelled with an E, but it's not that at all. Uh, entreat me not to leave, uh, Dan Forrest. Okay, cool. Now let's jump to your hand up on Echo uh, Conference okay. Rehearsal Goals. Um, this is a handout that I'm going to go very quickly through because I'm going to jump into the other repertoire so that we can sing for another 35 minutes or so, or so, 35, 40 minutes. But I did want to give you this. this. These are my rehearsal goals to what I would like to accomplish in rehearsal. Number one, lead the students to beauty. You know, focus on phrasing, expressing faces. That's what we try to focus on in rehearsal rather than notes and rhythms. I have a couple phrases. Please sing phrases, not notes. It's amazing you just say that to the choir and you start looking at bigger chunks, okay? Another thing, as I said earlier today to you, can you sing that more musically? You know, um, that's just a real easy phrase that will really help them. <laughs> Teach students how to listen and what to listen for. There's all, we could do a whole session on that, right? Um, divide the choir in half and have them sing for each other. Um, years ago at a national convention, I think it was in San Diego, Jingling Chan divided her in half. They sang the Star Spangled Banner and they took different kinds of breath. Henry Lake does a similar thing with that color, but how you can change the color depending on the breath that you take. Also, throwing colors out, seeing this purple, seeing this yellow, seeing this red, seeing this green, so that they start having different concepts of listening. But I love the fact of dividing and having one half sing and then the other half listen. And then a lot of times you can fix things because they just hear what the other half is doing. Next, front rows, just you turn around and you face the other side and just sing to each other that way and you have to move. This is one I haven't done that often, but I just thought of it uh, like a couple months ago. Just count down the row, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and say, let's hear all the ones. And then you're, the group is sitting within the choir listening to people around you very intently, and then you say, now let's hear all the twos. And it helps them really start doing a better job listening within their section. Have each voice part, this is great. How often do you do this? Maybe you do this a lot. I don't do it enough. Have each voice part sing for the rest of the choir. Let's just hear the tenors. And then the tenors sing. You know, and this is after you've been working a while. And then they listen, and then you, then you look, at, look at the altos and say, so what are you hearing from the tenors? What, 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 you know, what are you hearing, you know, Mr. Purple Shirt? And so, and 
then we get the response, well, I really liked this, and that's the other rule. You have to say something positive to begin. I really like the phrase shape that I really think the vowel works so well. And then it's amazing how you go through each section, and then the whole choir gets better, even if you don't have, even if you don't have a ball set. And then I have them sing an odd test, um, and, uh, and we talk about what they did well and how they, we can improve from this. Not, I didn't hear this, I didn't hear that, this was missing, they missed the E flat. It's like, what did they do well and how can we improve? I have part checks. I have like a part check where they stand up, do part checks for memorization checks, you know. And they know that they're, if they don't come prepared, that it will affect the grade. I mean, I do that. Um, they, and they don't like it, and I go, oh, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but it, they need those deadlines. They really do to get things ready in time. But that's great to have the out test scene. Number three, help students understand the musical intent of the composer, but maybe not right away. You pass out a new piece, you know, and you get up and say, okay, uh, this is my, um, this is my mom, and, uh, and uh, they grow a composer, and you live in these cities, and this was the computer, and so on. And you know what? That's not what drew you to the music, I don't think. What drew you to the music is either the text or the score. So I always wait a couple rehearsals, and then we talk a little bit about the story. Um, and um, performance practice, you know, immediately. Immediately as you're going through. Um, number four, give the members of the choir the uh, opportunity to uh, have as much responsibility as, as possible. We talked about that this morning. Um, a lot of times kids come into me and they say, oh, well, I have my recital, or I have the opera, or I have four hours of rehearsal last night, and you know what? I really don't want them to sing if they're vocally fatigued, if they have laryngitis, or if they're sick. Um, so I have them sit out, and when they sit out, they have to take notes on all the rehearsals. They sit with the music, and they write everything they're hearing. Oh my god, I can't believe the cool notes that I get. They come back and they give me like two pages. <laughs> Serious, two pages of notes uh, and little things that they heard, and a lot of times things I have not heard. And so I, I incorporate that. I go to my office and I incorporate all those into the next rehearsal. And it's and they don't just sit and go, oh, we sit in the back, we sit today. No, out with a piece of paper and they have to hand it in to me at the end of the rehearsal. And I don't care how old they are, they're going to hear things. They're going to hear diction things. I'm just shocked at some of the things I get. Um, and from them, from students you don't expect. You know, the, not the music ed kids, like like the like the engineering student. The engineering students in the right oh, well, the rhythm here doesn't look quite right. It's, it's a really good <laughs> sticky notes we already talked about. Five, help each student to understand the importance of their role in the music making process. I said this this morning. Every time there's some kind of improvement, try to give some kind of, you know, that was better. That was better. Uh, new students in my the choral ed class, when they're conducting, they'll stop and say, Awesome! That was just awesome! And I said to the back, oh, it, wasn't. it wasn't awesome. And you, from teachers, you know that if you false compliment, that doesn't work so well. Um, seating placements help them realize their importance. So if you don't, and you say, Well, I, I, I do junior high. I have junior high, my community choir, church choirs, they do a placement. 110 voice community choir. Soprano placements are after rehearsal on that night. And then we go through and figure out exactly where that person should sit. And I think it's really important because then I make that comment of, now this is where you belong. This, this is her view. Oh yeah, this is really great. I love singing here. Now just know how important it is that you're here between these two people. You know what I mean? That they count on you because this is where you, you are. So placements really help that. And I find that when you really emphasize that, people don't miss. And if they do miss, then I call back and they say, yeah, you know, Marge really misses the new next This is my community choir. And so it really will make a big difference. He encourages students to be creative with nonverbal and verbal rehearsal techniques. Um, I know that Jeffrey, and I'm going to head out to do the sit in some of your session this afternoon, was talking uh, uh, about movement in the rehearsal. I love dramatic readings, too, you know, to have them actually you know, or better yet, have them act out the part. You know, I had one of my students, <laughs> we were at a retreat, and we were doing Daemon, the Roman, <laughs> years ago, and I said, I would like, uh, let's, let's act that out. And we, well, in all the pieces. 
So this group's doing day one, and this piece is doing some folk song, this person, you know, this is the opening. And each group of the choir had something, and they had to do a skit and act it out. And one of the, one of the baritones of the choir dressed up in a sh shrine dress and, 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 and went, put on a wig to emulate me, but, you know, like, you know, it looked to look like me, but he was wearing horns. And to this day, I see this boy, and all I can think of <laughs> It's 15 years ago, but I, that's all I remember, is that, that skit. And so I think that it makes, uh, that's really great for them to do that. Um, some of these are Charlene's. Um, uh, uh, we all do these circles in, but also circles toward. Spin the plate. I think that's a Shar thing. Spin the plate for energy. You know, like you know, like you're in the, the those you know, like, nah, you know, and they get all the plates spinning, and then it starts wobbling, and then you have to get it going again. Uh, I think that's helpful. Play the Glockenspiel for clean entrances. You know, so everyone plays a Glock. Here's the entrance. Um, iron a pair of pants for Tenuto. Play the cello. We talked about that. This we'll talk a little bit more about in the conducting tonight. The oral image of the score is about the amount of music that you can hear without hearing, without any oral stimulation. It's an oral image. What you're trying to develop the score. This is by, if you do it by sitting down with the score, without sitting at the piano, without singing it, without hearing a YouTube video, or a CD, you just sit down and you see how much you can get in your head. And that gives you the oral image. The oral image is often limited to the objectivity of our vision. We end up doing all the score prep, and then we look down at the score, and then we go, oh yeah, you're supposed to be that there. Oh yeah, you're supposed to be that there. And so what we end up doing is we look at the beats, we look at the releases, we look at the cues, we do all of that, and then we teach based on what we're seeing on the score as they're singing. Are you with me? And the next line, the more subjective approach is to conduct what we're expecting to hear based on the oral image that we've done at the desk. I'm conducting that is what I'm conducting. And then I compare those two, but it needs that, that combination of the two, I think, to be really successful. If you only look at the score and say, oh, wait a minute, here comes that note. I wonder if they're going to get it. Then it's always about drill. No, it's just that. No, it's just this. But if you're actually conducting what you want to hear, then you end up having a more creative process because you can say, no more shape there, no more freedom there. You see, does this make sense? This is kind of a new thing. Um, and, I, and I got some of this concept from a band director that I was doing an uh, honor choir with, and we all went to each other's sessions. And I sat and talked with him about this, and I just think it's wonderful. And I want you to try it sometime with your kids. Really think about, and then sit, after you've done all that, then sit down at the piano and play. Then sing all the parts. But the first one is really staring at how much can I really hear without the music. Now let's jump to secular music. Are you ready? Here we go. I will arise and make music. This is for a junior high choir, a high school choir, a church choir. It's an opener. This is in that other book. Three against, three against, uh, kind of two. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, five, uh, five, uh, five. It's a great opener. And it talks about the power of music. Let's stand up. Here we go. Ready?
probably start like on page 11. You know, teach that. And then maybe go into this slower section that happens at 13. Guess what? Comes back at 15. Maybe do 11 through 16. Fast with refrain. And then go back to the beginning on another rehearsal. And they go, oh, wow. Do you see how quickly that this piece would probably come together? There's a little desk hand that comes in at 17. Let's try that. Here we go. 17. Short to long, 
we can strong change of direction and just because it feels right. <laughs> so it gives you a little leeway, but those are important. And this is what I don't hear when you're singing. It should be almost automatically, well, it's, it's kind of, after 40 some years, it's in my DNA to always be thinking, do you know what I mean? So let's try that. See if you can think about that. Short values having, you know, four emphasis. Then the thing is, is that when you have in the guts of a phrase, you have a half note divided into two quarter notes. And this is Edwin, Edwin Fissinger. Edwin Fissinger, North Dakota State University, fabulous, uh, Lucy Tarano, beautiful music. He always took, this is from a, a workshop that I went to see him present in Winter Park, Colorado. Edwin Fissinger was there, Howard Swan was there, Paul Solomonovich was there, Frank Pooler was there, and then there was this guy who came and he was like, oh, wow, these are really nice arrangements. And he played a cassette tape. He was like, here's my choir with the orchestra doing these. And we listened to him like, wow, these are really good. It was John Rutter. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I remember this from Ed Fissinger. If you want great legato, buy those three half notes or quarter notes into the Division, two eighths, two quarters, and just energize the back half of those beats. Energize the back half. That's where you get good look out of them. It's not from just saying, oh, connect the notes. You no, know, it's energy on the weak part of the note leading to the strong. Here we go. Ready, guys? I will energize the eighth, and then think back half energy on all the quarters. One, two, guys, go. I will make a
but it's, it's just a really nice piece. I'm going to move on. We're going to keep going. Uh, it was a lover in his last. This is by Ethan McGrath. He won this composition contest in 2014-15 with Lost and Gold. And, you know, next year, 2016, is the Shakespeare year. It's the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. Um, so it's, if you want to program a Shakespeare, some Shakespeare music next year, it is an anniversary year. Well, Ethan is, uh, he was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, or Tennessee, no, Tennessee. He's 25 years old. He's, he's very young. Um, he loved the music of Vaughn Williams. And we all know that Vaughn Williams wrote a lot of Shakespearean uh, kind of text. So this is great for dynamic contrast. Notice that the women have this ostinato thing at the opening. So it looks kind of like, oh, this is kind of uh, lots of Debussy and like, it's not that bad. It's, uh, it, and then the men come in with the Debussy later on on page eight, and then with the women. So let's just do a little bit of this. Here we go. And I'm going to do it in four. Here we go. But it should have kind of more of a very slow, rocking kind of thing. For reading, let's do it in uh, four. Here we go. One. Like, like four, probably like three or four pieces of each 
yeah. each one of those volumes uh, by the math here. Isn't that kind of interesting? Mm -hmm. Nice work for, for a young composer. I really want to kind of promote that. Uh, next is uh, Lador Bador. Do you know this piece? Yes? How many of you have done this piece? I did it this past year. It's just a beautiful piece. It needs a wonderful soprano solo. Is there anyone who wants to jump in and jump first? No? Is there some sopranos like you would say, oh, well, I will do it? There's one. There's one. Oh, good. You want to, you'd like to sit together? I don't know what page is it on. What page is it on?
saxophone. And we all know that Johnny has gone for a soldier. It's, you know, it was originally written it's an English folk song, but they transferred it into a Revolutionary War song. It's wonderful for phrasing. It's a great piece to teach phrasing. Um, and it's a beautiful new setting. It's for piano and a soprano solo, soprano soloist and sax. Um, measure uh, page five, look at page five of your score. That's for four part women. And then it has a four part men thing, and then I'm going to the six. Okay? So let's do a little bit of reading of this. Can we just start with the ten of uh, soprano sax? Two bars of piano. Here we go, ready? And three and four.
time. Out of time, but we will get to some more of this. Okay. I will remind you. 